Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the last uh, webinar session from Woodburn Accountants and Advisors for 2019. You've joined us for the workshop series on company audit, tax, and employee compliance in China. And you have joined us today for part three, which is the audit and tax compliance requirements in China. You've got to start the process now. Are you in your first year of operation in China? Are you aware that you have a year-end audit to complete in less than two months? Do you know what type of audit you have to complete? Have you started preparing for the annual and tax compliance procedures? If not, then this is the workshop for you to learn and understand what needs to be done to remain in compliance. So what are we covering today? We're gonna to be covering the type of audits you need to prepare, who qualifies for an audit, what are the annual compliance procedures that every company must follow, what are the deadlines for these annual compliance procedures, and tips on making sure that you remain in compliance. Now I just wanna start off, you know, who is this webinar for? The webinar is for you if you are a newbie to China, so for those of you that are not yet established in China, but you're looking for an opportunity or you're trying to educate yourself on the Chinese market and how to operate a company, then this will definitely be a webinar for you because you will need to understand what compliance procedures have to take place on an annual basis and add that into your budget. If you are a startup, you better get yourselves familiar with what needs to happen on an annual basis. For me, the startups are generally the one, the companies that are one to three years old, um, always focused on their core business and always being a little bit complacent on the administrative functions that have to happen within their entities and structures. Even if you are an experienced China hand, there are always changes that are occurring on an annual basis, particularly in relation to uh, deadlines and in relation to consolidations of certain aspects. So depending on what city you're based in, then this might also be a webinar for you to get yourselves updated on what you need to know. Um, how I like these webinars to function is I really, really wish for you to interact with me. Ask me your questions. This is an opportunity for you to ask your questions. So um, I generally educate and teach and give a lot of information. So definitely grab yourselves a pen and paper, take notes. Um, I may ask questions at some point as well. So please do interact. It gives me a bit of background about who you are, what you might need. Um, and again, I'd be happy to spend time on any questions that do pop up. Why am I able to help you? Well, I am a, well, my name is Christina Kohler Kaluccia, apologies for that. And I have been in the corporate services sector for 16 years in China, specifically in Shanghai. I've been working with over 500 international companies on their market strategy, implementation, and growth in China. Um, and I'm also a creator of the China Roadmap Program, which highlights what a journey should be for a foreign investor in China. Um, most importantly, I have my own entities in China. So I've gone through it all. I know what it means to be compliant and what it takes to remain in compliance. So in a lot of the case studies and stories that I'll be uh, explaining today, um, a lot of them may pertain to me as well. Uh, if you enjoy this webinar and you enjoy some of reading well, free information about China, then you are more than welcome to subscribe on our website at woodburnglobal.com to our free and complimentary weekly uh, newsletter, uh, which always highlights a publication, upcoming webinars, and more details about China and Hong Kong. Or you can also follow us or follow me on LinkedIn, and we also have a YouTube channel that you can subscribe to to get all the latest updates and videos, recordings, and whatnot. So, why should you be concerned by audit and tax compliance in China? Well, for the main reasons, number one, you can only distribute and repatriate profits or dividends back to the shareholding structure if you have completed the annual audits and settled all of the various tax liabilities and completed all of the annual inspection 
process, please. Failure to do any of these steps can result in extra expenses, penalties, and in the worst case, a revocation of your business license. So it is extremely important to make sure that your audits and your tax compliance steps are all done in time. Now, a lot of people complain to me about doing their audits and you know having to go through the process, and especially if they're a startup in China, if they're in that phase, you know, why do we have to do an audit? Our numbers are so minimal. Well, don't forget that the auditors are a fresh set of eyes on your business. So if you choose the right auditor, they should be able to help your business and find mistakes in the day-to-day -day operations. They should also be able to improve your financial reports and do things in accordance with PRC GAAP so that the data is presented accurately and correctly. Um, and they are also there to double check on your tax obligations and most importantly, identify any unnecessary tax payments. So, you know, the best thing that you can achieve is obtaining a tax refund or a tax credit from your tax bureau. And the only way to do that is having this fresh set of eyes and having these auditors come in. But this leads me to a really important point um, that I will express a little bit later on about choosing your auditor. You want an auditor that offers all of these positives to you, okay? Going with the cheapest provider won't give you these opportunities. You want to go with the right auditor. So what are the annual compliance processes in China? Well, the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to complete your year-end financial management reports. And this is where my biggest frustration occurs with most companies. The reason why this is my biggest frustration is because in China, you are required to produce monthly reports in order to be able to declare your VAT payable on a monthly basis and also to do your profits tax on a quarterly basis, which means you have the ability to uh, read, analyze, and adjust your financial management reports in an extremely timely manner. Do people do that? No, they do not. And this is the dilemma that occurs then at the year end. So what happens at the year end is, at least in my situation over the last 16 years, I will get probably about 80% of my clients urgently contacting our firm in order to make adjustments, um, analyze reports, and fix the numbers. By that time, a lot of it can't even be adjusted any longer. So you've got to make sure, if you are running your own business in China, Use the advantage and read and analyze your reports on a monthly, if not at least a quarterly basis so that adjustments can be made timely, that you're not rushing things at the year end. Now, why do I say about rushing in the year end? Well, we have in China a beautiful year end where if you are a foreign investor, all the foreigners will probably be on Christmas and New Year vacation, which will be coming up now for the next two weeks. And in 2020, particularly, there's going to be a very early Chinese New Year starting from the 24th of January. So you basically have January, a very tight, less than 15 working days to fix your year-end financial management reports. So closing off December and closing then off the year. Not only that, but you've got to book your auditors. You've got to make sure that the schedules are in the calendar so that straight after Chinese New Year, you can get cracking on getting the reports and the audits done. So it is a rush process. And if you've got only 15 working days to um, settle your accounts and settle your year-end reports to make them accurate, make them you know, correct, um, it is a very, very tight time frame. So this is one tip I will offer to everybody if you haven't done so. If you haven't analyzed or read your numbers or you, you you know you feel like there might be adjustments that have to be made start the process today today in terms of reading them going through them and if you've got any questions go to your provider go to your accountant and start asking them okay so that it isn't a rush and adjustments can be made in time then you've got the annual audit report the profits tax reconciliation annual reporting to the aic annual reporting to all of those beautiful um, abbreviations right there that i'll go into detail as well later you'll also have annual customs reporting and annual foreign exchange reconciliation reports 
as long as you follow these easy steps, you will be able to remain in compliance and you will have the opportunity, if you are profitable, to repatriate your dividends. So let's start off with the annual audit report. And I'm under the assumption that most of you, if not all of you in today's webinar are um, managing limited liability companies in China. If you are managing a representative office, please do reach out and book an appointment with me so that I can walk you through that because it is quite different from having a liability company. So in terms of the annual audit, the annual audit report consists of a balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement. And usually there are two reports that are being produced. One is the financial report and one is the foreign exchange report. In some cities, the foreign exchange report can be taken out of the annual audit report and consolidated with one of the other steps that I will touch on. But in some cities, it is still required that both these reports are separated. If you look at the tier one cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, only the financial report is gonna be looked at in terms of the annual audit report, which means looking at the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement. So to ensure that foreign invested companies meet the Chinese financial and accounting standards, the annual audit report must be conducted by a external licensed accounting firm. Um, it should be a certified public accounting firm that is registered in China. Um, one tip that I will have for you is make sure that whatever auditor you're choosing is not blacklisted at the tax bureau. Because if they are list, uh, blacklisted at the tax bureau and you can get these lists from the tax bureau, then you're gonna be spending a lot of money on audit for a report that the tax bureaus won't even accept. So make sure that your auditor is in compliance and is not blacklisted. Um, so what needs to be taken into consideration for the annual audit report is that the deadline should really be no later than April 30th in order to make sure that the profits tax reconciliation can be done by May 31st. You wanna give a one month barrier between the completion of the audit and the completion of the profits tax reconciliation. So keep that in mind. It generally does take time to book an appointment with an auditor. So you wanna do this today. Um, it does take time for the auditor to sit down. If you are a small company, then usually they'll only need about one to two working days in your office. If you are a large organization, expect five to seven or eight working days in your office, plus then time to produce the reports. So you're looking at a time frame from the point that they enter your office to the point that the reports are being produced for it to take about two months, okay, eight weeks. So you've got this very strict date deadline, and I've put it here as a deadline of April 30th so that you have enough time um, in order to make sure that the profits tax reconciliation is done properly. Now, just a couple of things on how to choose the right auditor in China. And I've kind of come up with a couple of questions that you should probably raise within your organization or ask yourself of what are critical when communicating or choosing an auditor. The first point is, do you have the ability uh, to communicate with the auditor? Do the foreigners, particularly the CFOs that are sitting abroad who potentially don't speak any Chinese, are they able to communicate with the auditors? You want to find an auditor that you can communicate with. You want to find an auditor that your team and probably bosses can also communicate with because you're talking in financial language here. So you want your finance team to be able to communicate directly with them. And if you are a foreign invested company, you will probably find out that your overseas CFOs can't speak Chinese and want to be able to communicate with someone properly. The second point is very clearly, what is your budget and cost for the audit? Um, there are tremendous price differentials between using the big four like Deloitte, Ernst & Young, KPMG, PwC, compared to using a local certified public accounting firm. Um, so obviously look at your budget, look at your cost. And as a tip here, why not contact three to four different auditors to check on budget, 
cost and also schedule. Do they fit in your schedule? Um, so make sure you reach out to a few to get this price differential. They will ask to see your financials in order to give you a budget. Um, so you got to make sure that, you know, somehow your financials are up to date. What you also want to look at in the audit is accuracy and reliability. Is the auditor taking a standard template, which is what most local and small certified public accounting firms do? They just do the basics and hence their budget is allocated like that. Or do you want a firm to do something a little bit more detailed? Like I said earlier, I'm going to go back to this slide. The positives of doing an audit is that an auditor can help businesses find mistakes on a day-to-day -day basis. They can help improve the financial reports and they can double check on your tax obligations. If you're choosing just a very simple auditor that does a very fast and quick audit report that will just be utilized for the annual compliance procedure but is no additional benefit to you, great. But I mean, especially if you're a startup, don't you want someone to go more in depth? Um, think about that very carefully. Profits tax reconciliation is the next step. This is generally due by May 31st of each year. Now, I say generally because honestly, it's going to vary by city uh, and potentially by district. So what you want to do today, well, not today because now the tax bureaus are closing, but tomorrow is you want to talk to your tax officer about what deadlines you have in terms of the whole compliance procedure and steps. And he will then provide those to you. So in China, you, uh, as you probably know, profit tax has to be paid either on a monthly or quarterly basis in accordance with the figures that are shown in the accounting books of the company. And companies are required to file um, the profit tax returns within 15 days from the end of the month or the quarter period. However, as there are discrepancies between China's accounting standards and the tax laws, the actual profits taxable income is usually different from what the total profit shown are shown in the accounting books. As such, you have to do this profits tax reconciliation report. And obviously, the advantage of this profits tax reconciliation report is if you have overpaid, then you will get a reimbursement or a tax credit. So this step, although you know it is tedious, the advantage of it is that it does help you to make sure you haven't overpaid your taxes. And obviously, if you've underpaid your taxes, then you need to supplement those tax amounts. It is important that, the, that you are aware that the profits tax analysis is going to be using your year-end financial management reports together with the audit reports, as well as all the tax declarations that have occurred throughout 2019 um, to make the various calculations. Can extensions be applied for? So if you run into an issue at the start of 2020 and you're realizing that you're running out of time, you have the ability to apply an extension. It needs to be for an extremely valid reason. Go to your tax bureau in advance. If you know that you cannot meet the deadline that has been stated by the tax officer, then talk to him Meet with him in person, talk to him, and make sure that you have the ability to um, you have the ability to apply for that extension. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind: um, you may be required to also provide adjustment sheets to bridge the discrepancies between the tax and the accounting standards. Which is why, if there have been adjustments made, it would have been better if you had done them throughout the year. If you haven't done that, get started on doing that now. If you've had frequent transactions with related parties, then you probably do have to prepare an annual affiliated transaction report on transfer pricing issues. So this may be a supplementary document that you have to provide together with the profits tax reconciliation report. Again, talk to your tax officer about what you need to submit according to your 2019 uh, financial reports and your tax declarations, okay? It is also important to note um, that you may need to engage a certified tax agent firm in China to prepare another separate 
profits tax audit report. This is something that's come out, which is relatively new. Um, in Beijing, I'm gonna just compare between Beijing and Shanghai because you should again talk to your tax officer to see if this is actually needed. In Beijing, this requirement applies to firms that meet some standards like um, yearly loss exceeding 100,000 RMB or carrying over last year's losses to deduct this year's income or yearly sales revenues that exceed 30 million RMB. Um, in Shanghai, the, this type of profits tax audit report is needed if um, taxpayers uh, who have offset losses carried forward from previous years or taxpayers who have made a loss of more than 5 million RMB. Um, remember, deadline is May 31st. Speak to your tax officer about your specific deadline and the documents that have to be submitted. In terms of annual reporting to the Administration of Industry and Commerce, this is all the information that has to be provided. Um, it is extremely detailed. If you do have questions about it, let me know. Otherwise, reach out to your AIC to understand what needs to be submitted for this type of reporting. Um, basically, what the government wants to know is background about the company, uh, stats about the company. They want to have um, yeah, just general statistics, things like headcount. Uh, if you have retail shops, where do you have retail shops? If you have online stores, where do you have online stores? They'll want to know some of the top line figures within your P&L and balance sheets. Um, you know, they'll want to know quite a few things about your company. Usually there is a type of questionnaire that's uh, completed online. Um, but again, speak to your AIC about it. The deadline for this is usually June 30th. Um, so once your annual audit is complete, profits tax reconciliation report is completed, then you move on to this form of annual reporting. In addition to that, <laughs> you also have to do annual reporting to the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Finance, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, the State Administration of Taxation, and the National Bureau of Statistics. Um, all of this, again, can be done online through an annual combinative reporting system. So it's one online questionnaire that's actually then distributed and submitted to all of these various bureaus. Um, I think one thing that's important to note that has changed in recent years is that uh, the AIC, as well as all of these other various government offices, no longer take the role of judges. They are now taking on the role of supervisors. And what this basically means is they can no longer disapprove reports that are submitted, even if they think the reports are unqualified. What they can do is make suggestions on how to fix certain things, amend certain things, add certain things, um, but they can't disapprove any form of report without any um, suggestion or feedback. Relevant, um, the relevant government bureaus, so these, these government bureaus will then affix their seals on the report that are then uh, produced. Again, the deadline for this is June 30th. It would be advisable to talk to the AIC about the deadlines and talk to these bureaus also about the various deadlines. The annual customs reporting, um, this is something that needs to be checked, whether it can be done together with this step. So the annual reporting for these various bureaus generally now allows for the customs reporting to be added in. In some cities, however, the annual customs reporting has to be done separately, okay? Um, so, the purpose for this annual customs reporting is for enterprises or companies that are subject to customs administration, meaning that they're doing a lot of import and export, as well as companies that are in manufacturing, um, they need to submit this, this form of customs data. Um, again, the deadline is June 30th. As mentioned, in most cities, for example, the tier one cities, the information and content for the customs data will be included um, in the combinative reporting. In some cities, it will be considered as separate. 
The last step is the annual foreign exchange reconciliation report. Um, and here, again, you've got to be aware that in some cities like Shanghai and Beijing, this is part of the combinative reporting. So this step here, meaning that all the data about the foreign exchange can be added in. If it is considered separate, it is a separate audit report then, and it is then submitted to the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. So it is extremely important to know whether this has to occur within the combinative or whether it has to occur separately. Now, I didn't wanna just end presentation and looking at the various steps that are required for the compliance. But as mentioned, if you follow those steps, then you are going to be completely up to date. What happens though, once all those steps are completed, you have, you are profitable and you want to start distributing dividends. Now this becomes a little bit more complex. So this is also what I wanted to add in today's presentation is looking at the steps required to do the dividend repatriation. If you are a startup in China, most likely you won't have any profits to distribute. But if you are an experienced China hand, then this might be something that you are looking at. So as you all know, in all of China, the profits tax um, or enterprise income tax is set at 25%. Um, there are now obviously certain benefits being offered to companies depending on size of operation um, and specific category of sector. So if you are considered an SME in China, you will have definitely a tax reduction. If your revenue is under 1 million RMB, then it'll be at 5%. If it's between 1 and 3 million RMB, it'll be approximately 10%. Over that, it's at 25%. If you're in the high tech sector, you will also have reductions in tax rates. But what happens once you have done the transparent route, you've done all of these compliance steps for audit and tax and inspections with all the various government bureaus, what happens at that point? Well, before distributing after-tax profits, you've got to make sure that your company makes up any losses that are carried forward from previous years. So that's step number one. The second step thereafter is that foreign investors are required to allocate a certain rate of after-tax profit, which is determined by the board of directors or executive director to reserve funds, enterprise development Funds, staff incentive funds, welfare funds. Reserve funds are used generally to cover any losses suffered by a foreign investor. Enterprise development funds are used to expand the operation and increase, and increase the investment, obviously with local approval from the government bureaus. And staff incentive and welfare funds are an irregular reward to employees and other collective staff welfare. So these are allowances um, that are being offered to, to employees, and then generally it's for much, much larger organizations. Now, in terms of the reserve funds, enterprise development funds, staff incentive, and welfare funds, there are a couple of things that you have to be aware of. Firstly, for foreign invested enterprises, they are required to allocate at least 10% of their after-tax profit to a reserve fund, and they cannot reduce this rate until the fund reaches about 50% of the allocated registered capital. Um, foreign investors, so WUFIs and FICES, they don't have to have a development fund and staff incentive and welfare fund. Uh, for joint ventures, there's no minimal or maximal limit on the amount allocated to these funds. The board of directors usually decides on the allocation ratio on their own initiative. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the documents in the profits tax reconciliation that you may have to provide is one showing the sister related transactions. And this has to do with the transfer pricing regulations in China. So when you have to prepare a local file for transfer pricing, you need to have reached one of these four levels. I've highlighted the fourth level because that's generally what people are reaching at, which is um, sister party related transactions that exceed 40 million renminbi. At that point, you've definitely got to start creating a local file. And if you are in this period now where you have exceeded any of these items and you haven't pre prepared a local file yet, do it now. Start now. Okay? Because they will then ask that during the profits tax reconciliation report. Another thing that you've got to start thinking about 
um, particularly when you're handling the annual compliance steps, is the double taxation agreements. And you know, between almost every country in the world, China has a DTA. Here, I've put an example of one with the UK. If you look at the last column, which are the new DTA rates, I say new, but it's been quite a while already, those are the rates that are gonna become applicable. So if you're developing repatriation strategies or you're looking to repatriate dividends, these are the rates that are going to be applicable. However, it is not automatic. Just because you're transferring funds to your UK shareholder or a UK sister-related party, that these rates will apply. Any time that you have agreements in place, uh, any time that you have transactions that are occurring, you need the agreements to be in place and have them approved by the tax bureau prior to the invoice being issued and the repatriation occurring. Okay, so as part of your to-do list, as you are discovering, you know, what are your various deadlines? What documents and information have to be submitted to the various bureaus as you're talking to your tax officer? You're going to be asking about the tax excuse me, the um, profits reconciliation tax deadline, and you're going to be talking to your tax officer about what documents have to be submitted based on your 2019 performance, and you should be proactively telling him you have a desire to repatriate dividends. As such, you want to follow the DTA, okay? Because like I said, it is not automatic, all right? So make sure that you do that so that the 5% is applicable to you and not the 10%. Now, when you go through the dividend repatriation process, there are a couple of things that you have to think about. First are the business strategy considerations. So after tax profit can only be repatriated if the registered capital has been injected in total, prior year's losses have been made up, and statutory reserve funds where required have been set aside. So what you're probably discovering now is, is that it's going to take a long time till you actually repatriate dividends um, because you got to have the full capital injected, losses made up, statutory reserve funds allocated, up to, which are up to 50% of the registered capital value. So it will probably take a few years before you even consider to do a dividend repatriation. But these are the business strategies that you do need to consider. Then you've got the tax considerations. And like I mentioned earlier, if you're gonna be repatriating dividends to the UK shareholder, you know, talk to your tax officer about making sure you get the 5% withholding tax. Don't be surprised if the tax officer starts asking questions about the UK shareholder. Things like, what are the economic and commercial substances that exist within that entity? They may ask for documentation and proof of the existence of substance. So things like payroll lists, transactions that have occurred. They may want to look at the balance sheet. They may want to look at the P&L, et cetera. They only, if you want to make, sorry, if you want to take benefit or take advantage of the DTA and the rates that are included in that, be prepared for these questions that will pop up. Now, if you are an old China hand, you can completely imagine that you probably used a Hong Kong company as an intermediary between your shareholding company and the China subsidiary. Between the Hong Kong and China DTA, there's also a 5% withholding tax. But if your Hong Kong company is purely a holding, then there will be no substance shown in it. And there again, you will run into difficulties if your tax officer is asking those questions. So think about these tax considerations now as well. Also be prepared on what the outbound payment process looks like. So what will the bank usually ask you when you want to repatriate dividends? So the first item makes complete sense. What they will want to see is the annual audit and they will want to see that the profits tax reconciliation report has been completed, submitted, and signed off by the tax officer. They will want to also see a resolution that's been signed to distribute the profits as dividends. Um, that resolution will be signed by the board of directors or the executive director. Don't forget that you've got to apply for the DTA benefits. As I said, talk to your tax officer about that before the transfer is actually completed. So you need to make sure that the tax filing has occurred before the transfer has been completed because the bank may ask to see the tax proof for that specific dividend transfer. 
they will probably want to see the filing of the profits tax return, as I mentioned earlier, the annual profits tax return. Um, the bank will usually ask you if the amount is over 50,000 USD to also do a record filing with the tax bureau versus the state administration of foreign exchange. And then finally, you can do the bank payment. So it's just something to tell you that it's not a simplified process. There are a lot of steps you need to consider. You need to think about it from a business perspective, a tax perspective, and a bank perspective when you're doing any of these types of repatriations, whether it's dividend repatriation or any other form of overseas transfer. Then I wanted to go on, because we are at the end of the year, we've also got to think about things from an HR perspective. So I wanted to offer four year end tips for employers in China um, about what they need to consider now that it's the year end um, about their employees. So the first is obviously count all the employees annual leave days and other days of leave um, in the current year, like sick leave, for example, or maternity leave or other forms of leave, and how many days may be taken over to the next year. Depending on your employee handbook and the policies that you have initiated, if they haven't taken their full leaves, maybe some will be passed on to 2020, um, maybe not. Do you then pay it out? These are all things that need to be calculated now in this month. Um, if you are outsourcing to labor dispatch agencies or you're um, outsourcing payroll functions to a service provider, look at your contracts. Do contracts have to be renewed? Um, are prices going to be increased by them? Talk to them about what needs to occur within 2020. It's always my recommendation at this point in year probably because you're doing your budget, um, or hopefully you're doing your budget, is also to set a recruitment plan, training schedule, look at your headcount following year. Um, last but not least, you know, with your key employees, it's now the year end. Chinese New Year is coming up very soon. You want to start having one-to-one -one meetings with the various employees to talk about feedback, how was the year, um, you know, you want to look at their, basically do their reviews, but also get a review from them about the company. You know, usually people are always expecting to do a review on employees. Be positive and think positively and get a review from the employee about the company as well, because this might change your mind in how you do certain things for 2020. Now, I'm assuming that everybody has kind of read about the social credit system, so I also didn't want to leave that out because it is a compliance issue um, associated with the companies and it will be started in 2020. Um, so the Chinese government will complete the rollout of the social credit system in 2020. Um, it is a government established system to collect information, rate companies and individuals to enhance trustworthiness, compliance with social norms and legal requirements. The government has created an algorithm to determine the various ratings that are going to be assigned, and it's through big data analysis and facial recognition. There are incentives for good ratings, such as better credit conditions, easier market access, public procurement opportunities. For poor ratings, this can lead to fees, higher inspection rates, loss of government contracts and bids, as well as approvals that you may wish to have. Business partners, senior managers, legal reps can affect a company's rating as well and vice versa. So the individuals that are actually employed by the companies can affect the company's rate as can the company rate affect these individuals. Everyone is going to be what I call supervised and given a rate. Um, I think the whole purpose of this is truly to make sure Companies have, and individuals have a little bit of pressure to be compliant and ultimately behave um, and follow what is required of them. My biggest tip to you would be have open communication with your bureaus, whether that be the Labor Bureau, the Tax Bureau, the AIC, get clear information from them, ask them the questions, have meetings with them about what you need to do in 2020. Now, I tend to want to always finish up these presentations kind of explaining um, the China roadmap that Woodburn Accountants and Advisors has devised 
for companies that are looking to grasp at opportunities in China or implement safe and compliant structures as well as then focus on growth in the market. You know, each company that I have met with has had a different experience in China, has had a different journey in China. But basically, when you look at the overall journey of these companies or these individuals, the milestones and strategies have all been very similar. So the China roadmap has been created to show newbies in particular, as well as startups, what path they need to follow in order to be successful in China and grow exponentially. Um, if there is one part of these milestones that are not achieved, then obviously obstacles are gonna appear. There's gonna be roads that are blocked along the road of, of your China success. So it is important to look at this China roadmap and see what you can do to improve and make your companies more efficient. So four ways that you can work with me to be in compliance for 2020 for your fiscal year of 2019 well, one is I'm happy to advise you on what your company has to do. I'm also happy to speak with your various bureaus to find out what deadlines exist. We can also help to do health checks and internal audits before you actually perform your annual audit. Um, we're happy to fulfill the actual annual compliance procedure, except to do the audit. We do not have the license to perform audits in China. Um, and then last but not least, we can also help you create repatriation strategies um, to get your money out of China. If all of this resonated with you and you want to talk with me, then please don't hesitate to do so. In the chat box, I'm going to put in the link to um, setting up a meeting with me so you can have a one-on-one -on -one discussion about how you can remain compliant and what steps you do need to make. So go ahead, click on that link. Uh, don't be shy and you can set up a, an appointment with me. Um, no questions have been coming in during today's presentation, so I'm under the assumption that everything was extremely clear and transparent. Um, as it is the last webinar for me for 2019, um, I'm probably going to leave it there so we can finish early. As mentioned, don't hesitate. Book a strategy session with me, and I'd be happy to talk with you. Just so you're aware, in January 2020, at the end of the month, we're going to be doing a workshop series on distribution of goods and services. And we've split it out into four webinar workshops. So if you are interested in that, go to our website at woodburnglobal.com events or slash events, and you have the ability to then register. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. And last but not least, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. Uh, a wonderful start to 2020, and I look forward to seeing you all again in the new year. Take care and goodbye.